give them that final high five, handshake, tell them how good they look this morning. Man, so glad to have you uh, in church with us this morning. I got to meet a few people that are your first time guests here today, so thank you for joining us. And if you're a first time guest, I didn't get to meet you, I'm sorry, would love to have that opportunity. Uh, so a couple announcements I'll have for you. One is, if you didn't get a guide, we have experienced guides. Our ushers have them. Uh, they would be happy to bring you one. All you have to do is raise your hand. If you need a pen, I think we got pens. Do we have pens? All right, we ran out of pens a couple weeks ago. I think Mr. Mel got some new pens. But uh, if, you need a, if you need a guide or you need a pen to take notes, there's sermon notes inside of there. Uh, there's also a connect card in there, which gives you the ability to connect with us. Uh, hence the name. Uh, but especially if you're a first-time guest, there's a place for you to fill out your name and a little bit of information and mark first-time guest. Listen, no hassle guarantee. Nobody's showing up at your front door. Nothing weird. We just want to be able to communicate with you a little bit about the church. So if you'd fill that out, we would love it. On the back of the Connect card, prayer requests. We love to take your prayer requests. We have a team that comes every Tuesday morning to the church office and prays over your prayer requests. So if you have prayer requests this morning, write those out. Uh, we have a prayer team that is here. They're wearing blue lanyards. And so if you need somebody to pray with you before service, during service, out in the middle of my sermon, I don't care. Get up, find somebody with a blue lanyard. If you need to pray, uh, they're here to pray with you. Uh, but also, we like to tell new folks, bathrooms are right here inside of the auditorium, so don't go out looking for them. They're right here on either side, women here, men here. The other thing I get asked if I don't say, and that is we don't pass buckets or offering um, trays. Uh, everybody puts their offerings and their tithes in the boxes in the back of the room on their way out. So I just tell you that for your information. First time here, please do not feel compelled to give. Just wanted you to know that. So welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. Very, very excited about tonight. Um, tonight is our first of our summer game nights. So summer game nights tonight right here in this auditorium at 5 p.m. Game Show Studios is a company we have hired to come in, and we will be pay playing huge game shows right here on the stage. So tonight is here, air in the air condition. Come tonight, join us at five o'clock, have a good time of fellowship. Listen, here's one of the things I really want to say. If you really want me to be transparent and, and tell you why we're doing this kind of stuff, it's because several weeks ago we did something really cool and really, really powerful. We had each of the dinner, different generations stand up. Some of you guys remember that, right? And man, it was powerful to know this is the last place in our culture that all six generations get together in the church. It's the last place that all generations get together, and yet the Word tells us the older teach the younger. Well, how can the older teach the younger unless a relationship is developed so they can speak into their lives? So a big part of coming tonight, listen to me, is relationship, is fellowship. So can I ask you to do this? Don't come in and sit in your seat. Come on. Some of y'all are still mad right now because you came in and somebody was sitting in you your seats. But anyway, but don't, 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 listen, I want you to come all the way down front here. Let's try to mix, let's try to meet some people tonight. It's going to be all about relationships. So come join us. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun tonight. January, uh, July 31st, Fifth Sunday Family Worship is coming up again. Uh, this is a special one. We always have child dedications, baptisms. If either one of those are you, please get online and sign up. There's information all about it there. Uh, we would love to have you. But uh, can you believe this? We'll also that day be celebrating our fifth anniversary as a church, right? So Church of the Lakes will be five years old. We almost had their, uh, we've got a five-year-old that I baptized. There's a picture in the theater and I held her yesterday. We did a memorial service here yesterday and I held her yesterday and her daddy said, to put it into perspective, he goes, she's the same age as the church. And it was just kind of a cool physical, here, here's how old the church is, it was really kind of a cool thing. So fifth anniversary, come celebrate with us, it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. All right. Today we're actually finishing up a series that we have called Jack and Jill. And i got to tell you my motivation from the beginning for doing this series. We are currently in our culture, we are in a new sexual revolution. Right? There was a sexual revolution that happened in the 60s. And it brought its own thought patterns and worldviews as to, as, as to deal with our sexuality. Well now we're in a whole different time period of a sexual revolution that's going on inside of our culture. And can I be honest, come on, for all of us, it's a little confusing. Like, do you know all the names and all the pronouns? And, you know, do, what do I call it? They, they, come on, like, it's confusing. And so, here's the crazy thing. We're the light of the world. Anybody forget that part of the Bible? We're the ones with the truth. We're the ones with the answers. So one of the questions that I was asked when we did our survey at Easter was, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with 
gender and sexuality and all this sort of stuff. And so when I was praying and going at this series, can I, can I be real blunt with you guys? I was kind of scared. Right? I was kind of scared. One, my, my fear was, God, I got to do this. I got to get this right. Right? If we don't get this right, everything else falls apart. If we don't get our homes right, everything else falls apart. The homes are not good. Church is not good. Community is not good. Culture falls apart. And so I had that. But then the other part of me, can I be, can I tell you how much of a human I am? And I was like, oh, man, are we going to have people that get mad, you know, because we say this is not right or that's not right. Or, can, or we kind of take a stand and draw a line in the sand. You know, I, I had these crazy pictures in my head when I was preparing for this a couple months ago of, like, protesters in front of the school. You know, I mean, honestly, I did. But if I'm really transparent, it was kind of like, and it was funny because there's a couple of different specific scenarios that the Holy Spirit put in my heart to say, no, I need you to do this. I want you to do this. The church needs to talk about this. But then the Holy Spirit said this to me. But in this series, we really don't need to talk about what we're against. Everybody on the planet can give you a pretty fairly accurate idea of what a conservative church is against. Right? Come on. I mean, they may present it not so great, or they may present it differently, but for the most part, you know what the problem is? They can't tell you what we're for. I'm not sure always the church can tell what they're for. We do a really good job of wagging our finger. We do a really good job of pointing and saying, no, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't. But what do? What are we supposed to do then? And why would we do it that way? And so I went at this series kind of with that mindset of, you know, I don't want to talk about this or that or what we're I want to talk about what we're for. I want to take God's word, his truth, and hold it up in such a way to go, check this out. This is awesome. Right? And that's what we've been working to do. So today, man, I'm excited. I'm excited because we Ooh, week one, we talked about truth and grace. Come on, y'all, truth and grace. As we're dealing with hot-button issues, it is critical that we have both, truth and grace, right? Truth without grace is mean, and it leads to rebellion, right? Grace without truth is meaningless, and it leads to relativism. But truth and grace is a medicine for the sorrows and aches and pains and the things that have been destroyed in our lives and in our culture. Truth and grace. And then we went into a couple of weeks talking about the unique and yet unified realities of men and women. Right? Let me teach you something this morning. You ready? Hey, men and women are different. Did you know that? I know, right? Who knew? No, we're different. And instead of us fighting science and Bible, let's just call it what it is. How do we clarify what God means and that God actually wants our best? So this week, week four, you ready? We're going to talk about godly sex. All my singles just went, oh, Lord Jesus. I was talking to the worship team before this, and a couple of the singles in there are kind of squirming. Can I say this to you? Listen to me. If you're squirming when I say that, it's because the world has sold us some crap. Sorry if I say it that way, but that's what it is. There is nothing about sex that should make us cringe unless it's dirty. Because, I don't know if you realize this, but God made it. God made it. And it's good. Can I get an amen from somebody on that one? The single people are kind of like, eh, can I say that? Anyway. So let me start with this. Can I just start with this simple reality? The devil did not create sex. God did. The devil did not create sex. God did. God created this thing to be a beautiful thing between a man and a woman as it's written in his word. And we're going to look at it here today. And I want to dive into a book that's an awesome book. It's called The Song of Solomon. And I don't know if you've ever read it. But you should read the book. Come on, somebody. Come on, ladies. Put down the Hollywood romance novels and look up the book of Solomon. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you're going to see what I'm talking about. So I want to jump right in. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. It says this. 
Solomon's Song of Songs. That's how that opens right there. What does that mean? Well, this is just, Solomon wrote a bunch of songs, or in this case, it's in book form. But he wrote a bunch of them, out of a thousand and five of them, if you want to get exact. And, and, uh, but this was the one. This, this is, this is the, the one, right? And in this book, there are three different voices that you hear in the story. There's Solomon, there's the wife, and then there's kind of onlookers. People are looking at this. Now, as we read through this, I'm going to help you understand who's talking. And so you can understand the, the three different people. The first part of the book, which we're going to kind of skip over, but it's all about attraction. It's all about what does godly attraction look like, right? What is appropriate? Like, you know, that whole scenario where, come on, guys, you look across and you go, oh, 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 oh. right? Come on. Bring them to the down arrow, like something happens inside of you. Right? What is godly attraction? And the book starts with that whole scenario. How to make yourself attractive God's way. And she starts. So here's, here's, here, here's, here's the wife in the scenario, right? She starts after this, and here it goes. Let him kiss me with kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Now, can I say this to you? She's talking here, and she's not talking about sexual love. She's talking about who he is as a person. I'm about to say something, and the ladies will be like, yes. One of the most attractive features of a man is how he treats other people. Right? Right, and that's what she's saying. Like, your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the, is the fragrance of your perfume. Your name is like a perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. I love that line. Did you hear what she said? She said, all the other women want you, but mm, 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 you mine. Right? That's what she says. Right? No wonder the maidens love you. And they begin this courtship relationship. Then in chapter 3 is the wedding. The wedding's crazy. You should read it. But my favorite detail, Solomon had, check this out, 60 groomsmen. All with swords. Come on, somebody. Like, I mean, it was, it, was, it was amazing. But today, today I want to pick up the story. Come on, y'all. And they are at the Marriott Hotel. Yeah. It's honeymoon time, right? With some very white clay. Come on. Now, here's some ground rules for today. Ground rules. Are you listening? No elbows. Write that down. No. No elbows. Right? No second sermons on the way home. No third sermons when it hits the fan later this week. Come on. Just don't filter today. Listen to me. Just don't filter today based on what has happened. Everybody here has something twisted in the area of our sexuality. Can we, can we start there? Can we start with an acknowledgement that everybody in the room here is a little twisted in this area of our lives? Now, no condemnation. We just want to figure out what do we do differently starting today? Right? What is it that God says that would bring fulfillment in this, right? The devil is perverting it. Because a verse that we've used since we started the church, John 10, 10, we always talk about that Jesus said, I want you to have life and life to the full. But preceding that, what does it say? The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the devil's trying to do. Trying to steal, kill, and destroy your life. We are in this sexual revolution in our culture that is trying to redefine what God has made. Trying to get rid of God's best. And you go, well, why? Why, why is culture doing that? Why is Satan doing that? Well, that's really easy. The answer is misery loves company. You see, Satan knows his ending. Do you know what the ending of his story is? It's this place we call hell. Hell was not created for people. Hell was created for Satan and anyone who chooses to follow him. And so he knows the ending. And so he thinks, I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. But God, is, God has blessings for you. I need you to hear that, young people. Please hear me. God has blessings for you that the world cannot produce for you. And it's a hundred times better. Fulfillment, joy, peace, it is all available to you. But there is a catch. You gotta do it God's way. You gotta do it God's way. Every time we step away from God's way, there are destructive consequences. 
So God created parameters around relationships, not to restrict fun, listen, but to safely guide us to joy and fulfillment. That's a loving God. That's not a, a hateful God that's going, Hi, I don't want them to have fun. I don't want to. And so often we, our sinful nature, loves to sell that tale to us. He's trying to give us an intimacy at a level that the world cannot produce. Are you hearing me? True intimacy. So let me start with this other concept that I've already said this, but let me just repeat it again. Men and women are different. When it comes to sex, come on somebody, men are microwaves and women are crockpots. It's scientifically been looked at. It takes men seven seconds to be ready for sex. Not women, come on women, it's like put on a candle, put some music, go take a shower. Come on. Don't lie. Oh, see, you know, I saw some of you laugh. And look, women are about the journey. Men are focused on the destination. Come on. Men are attracted to what they see. Women are attracted to what they hear. Big, big difference. So put on your seatbelts, right? See if I can get this right. Miss Courtney. Tray tables and seat backs in their full upright and locked positions. Store your carry-ons. Here we go. Are you ready? They're at the Marriott. Honeymoon night at this point. She has talked about 75% of the time. That's a different message. <laughs> Sorry. And, and now Solomon is going to talk, catch this, for 11 verses before he touches her. Write that down, gentlemen going to talk for 11 more verses before he touches her. Here he goes, Solomon. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes behind your veil are doves. Do you know why we have veils at weddings? Probably you don't. You just kind of always thought it was some weird thing. Because it's an unveiling. It's a ta -da. Right? And that's what he's talking about here. It's, it's, it's this moment, right, of Wow, and then he says this, your hair is like a flock of goats. Don't write that down, gentlemen. Don't write that down. Don't write that one down. Let me explain it. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. What the heck does that mean? Well, don't use this line, but let me give you a picture. On that mountain, they had, they had goats with darker black hair. So when they would run down the mountain, it was... Cascading, are you getting a picture? Here's what's going on there at the Marriott. Don't get embarrassed, but here's what just happened. Let me give you a better picture. Normally, the women at that time would have their hair up. Come on, y'all. She just took out the barrette and went. <laughs> now you got a picture of the verse. It's a Pantene commercial. Come on, y'all. Don't you love your Bible? You just got to learn to read it correctly. Come on, somebody. That's good stuff. And then it goes on your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn. Don't use that one exactly. Coming up from the washing, each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. You know what he says? He says, your breath smells good, your teeth are white, and oh my gosh, they're all there. Yes! That's what he says. We learned something really important about that verse. Do you know, you know what it is? She doesn't play hockey and she's not from Mississippi. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm from Mississippi, if you're, anyway. All right, let me keep going. Your lips, no, but this is, this is, come on, y'all, this is, it's good to be attractive, it's good to have, right, the, the hair, come on. Your lips are like scarlet ribbons, your mouth is lovely, your temples behind your veil are like halves of pomegranates. What's he talking about? He's talking about the redness of her cheeks, right? I mean, he's just, he's just walking down, like walking down her body and, and, and affirming her and telling her, come on, speaking good words. Come on, man, catch on to what we're talking about here. Right? Speaking these words. And then he says one that's kind of weird, but let me, let me explain it to you. Your neck is like the Tower of David. <laughs> okay. You sweet talker again, right? <laughs> Built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Here I need to understand the Tower of David was like the most honored 
place in the city. When my wife walks in a room, she takes the room. She, she walks in and with her head up and that smile of hers. And, the, and, and in that moment, she, she's the most honored position in that room. And, and that's, that's what he's talking about. A woman that is praised and affirmed holds her head up. Right? Those who, come on, those who are abused or neglected or treated badly, what do they do? This is, this is, this is talking about how we talk to them and treat them. And, and, and what's amazing is, he's talking about her like this, but if you go back and you read chapter 1, she says about herself, come on ladies, somebody's going to relate to this one. She says, I'm not that pretty, I'm not that good looking, like she's got all those body image issues and shame and self, come on, it's that self-talk that all of, most of you do anyway, maybe not all, but and she says, I'm not that attractive and my skin's dark. We like dark, we like tan now, but they did it back then, you know why? Because if you were dark, that was a sign of, you were a peasant because you had to work outside. So dark skin was like dry and cracked and all, and she says that if you go back and read chapter one, but what does he do? Here's number one. Godly sex is affirming. Godly sex is affirming. Before it gets physical, it needs to be affirming. How many of you know that women remember words? Come on, some of y'all have this. You know, you said something, they're like, and then she goes, you know, I, I remember when you said that, and you're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, seven years ago, you were wearing those ugly brown shoes. Come on, that's the clue for us, man. The words matter. Right? What we say, catch this, guys and girls, listen to me. Men like to be affirmed about their accomplishments. Let that sink in for a second. Men like to be affirmed about their accomplishments. Women like to hear what you mean to them or what they mean to you. Women like to hear what, what they mean to you. And how often we miss. Why? Because men are different. Women are different. We don't speak the same thing. Men, the worst words that we can speak are anything negative about her body. No elbows. No elbows. Because we're going to do from this day forward today. Today is not about condemnation. Today is about us saying, today can I do something different? To bring some godliness to this area of my life life, that, they are, that we say to them they're valuable, to the ladies, you're valuable and you're beautiful. Godly sex includes affirmation. Going on, Psalm Solomon 4 verse 5. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. You go, wait, what? what? Okay, let me, have, let me break it down for you. We're in a pretty redneck county, so this is going to work really well. How many of you have been hunting? How many of you have been hunting? Okay, there's some of you, right, seeing a hunting show or whatever. If there are two fawns, if there are two small baby deer, and they come running out playing with the lilies, you don't come out and go, hey, 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 hey. Why? Because they'll run off. Did you put it together? In other words, she's kind of tired of you slapping her on the butt. Right? Kind of, kind of tired of the overly physical kind of scenario. So can I say this to you, number two? Godly sex is tender. Godly sex is tender. See, she is not the object of his passion for personal use. To fulfill all of his fantasies, that's not what this is for. Now let me tell you, men enjoy responsiveness. Ladies, for you to respond... Right? Women like tenderness. Women like tenderness. And so here's a question that I get asked. Right? I will dive in. Are you ready? Hey, Pastor Mike, what's appropriate in the marriage bed? Like, can we be creative? Can, uh, did y'all just get a little uncomfortable about where I'm about to go? So can I give you an answer to that? How about this way? 
How about we filter it through her? Can you get creative? Absolutely. Can you enjoy what God created? Absolutely. But how about you filter it through if she's comfortable or, or, with not, or not? Which is why we need to stop looking at porn. Because we're creating things that are fantasies that we're asking somebody to do that they're not comfortable doing. And then we're mad and we're fighting over it. Because listen to me, Godly sex is tender. It's caring. It's affirming in the process, right? Song of Solomon 4 and 6. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Until the day breaks. All night long. Right? Lionel Richie stole this from Song of Solomon. I'm just telling you, he stole that song. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountains of myrrh and to the hills of incense. There's two of those. Yes, that is what they're talking about. Godly sex is not boring. Godly sex is passionate. Godly sex is passionate. But can I say this to you? Passion takes effort. For those of us who've been married for a while and we're in a relationship, and our brain is starting to say, ah, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. No, the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is more watered on the other side. We lose our passion. We lose our, 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 our work. I love, I love fireplace and campfires. Anybody else like fire? Like I can just sit there and be mesmerized by a fire. But do you know how much work it takes, right, to keep a fire? Same scenario. Now, there's a lot of us that have faked it. A lot of us have got them fake fires. You know what I'm talking about? That's going to work great in your house. Can I say this to you? It ain't going to work at all in your relationship. You got, you, you got to work. You got, I stand at a campfire. I don't ever sit down at a campfire. I stand at a campfire. I've got this OCD perfect fire thing going on all the time. Right? Anybody else relate to that? But when was the last time I took that kind of care? When it came to my relationship with my wife, that I'd never sit down, figuratively. That I'm on guard and I'm thinking about affirming her and I'm thinking about speaking words. Come on, y'all. Come on, guys. Go get some flowers. They put it right by the front door to try to help you out. <laughs> right? Do, do, do a little something that you haven't done in a long, long time. You went after that woman like crazy. And now you're like, yeah, you want to have sex? Come on! <laughs> now, ladies, I got to pick on you a little bit. Some of y'all come to bed in the moon suits. Come on now. <laughs> come on, or them things so thick that a solar flare couldn't see through. Come on now, come on. You can help out in the crowd. Listen, listen, listen. We need to talk about this stuff within the church. And some people are like, that's why I, I don't like us talking about sex in the church. Can I say this to you? I don't like us talking about sex anywhere else but the church. God created it. It's a good thing. It's something we should be talking about and we should understand and we should stop giving the messages to our young people. I had this conversation last Wednesday with all the 20-somethings in our small group and we were talking about this whole idea of living together beforehand and all this and the messages that they've gotten. The message they've gotten is, you know, you don't want to go into your wedding night being inexperienced. Like, you're not going to know what you're doing. It's going to be weird and awkward. Yes, that's, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. Because you have a lifetime to work together to figure out how to do this in a way that is affirming and passionate and good. Because that's the way God created it. Don't let the enemy sell you on an idea that opening up that passion too early is a good idea. It's not a good idea. We keep going. Song of Solomon 4, 7. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Wait a minute. Didn't she say she was ugly before? Is, is he dumb? Like, come on, man. Like, is there anybody without a flaw? Everybody's got a flaw. So what is he saying? Let me tell you what he's saying. She's not perfect. We know it. He's saying this. I choose to make you the standard. See, I'm going to tell you right now. Jennifer Matheny is the standard. All y'all trying to catch up. But here's the problem. The moment I start looking at porn, I create different standards. I create different ideas. Are you following me? In that process. Men, this says make her the standard. 
She is the standard, and I will not let anything else come along who's going to change the standard in that process. Porn creates another standard. So number four, godly sex is secure. Godly sex is secure. It's a security. We have an insecurity going on in our culture today. So much of it is tied to sex. So much of it is tied to how, how we don't feel good about ourselves and some body image issues and what we're spending, blah, 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 blah. Jen and I laugh all the time. Never do I go anywhere without some guy coming up to me going, so, how much do you bench? And I'm like, hey, I'm Mike. And I told her, I said, you know, for the first time in my life, I get the whole, hey, eyes up here thing. <laughs> I do. Like, it's weird. Like, like and I, I have people say that to me at church, like the first time they come or whatever, you know, kind of thing. Like, where do you work out? Or, you know, right? Because we're looking, because we're, what are we doing? We're comparing. Right? Lord, do I, is it, yeah, me, uh, insecure? Come on, is it Emma? Am I talking to anybody? Does that relate to anybody? That we compare and, boy, social media has messed us up in that area. But godly sex is secure. That's why we wait to put this thing on so that it's a lifetime commitment, so that it is secure, so that in that moment we can grow together and we can make each other the standard and we can hold each other up in that particular way. i got to keep going. Song of Solomon 4, 9. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your neck. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine. Does that sound familiar? He's repeating what she said earlier. Right? Earlier, she was like, you're, you're the best. She's going, no, 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 no. You're the best. And the fragrance of your perfume is better than any spice. He's repeating it. He goes on, your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. Yes, that's what that is. Come on. Can I figure that out? Come on, y'all. That's a French kiss. 1900 years before France was created. That's exactly what that is. So, Ashley is a Hebrew kiss. That means it's a Hebrew kiss and our God is cool. Come on, somebody. So, come on, come on, come on. Right? So here's the question I'll get asked by young people. How far is too far in a dating type, courting type of relationship? And here's Mike's opinion. Here's what I've kind of evolved to. I think a, what is too far is an open mouth kiss. I think if you've been dating a while, let's get pretty serious. A little simple kiss goodnight is, is kind of cool and all healthy. But as soon as it becomes a little more, as soon as it becomes a little passionate, let's talk about the reality of our bodies, young people. Your body is not made to stop. You understand what I mean? Once you stir that up, the body's like, let's go, baby, get it on. Come on. You are an escalator. Once you step onto the first step of the escalator, what happens? Unless it's broken. What happens? You go all the way to the top. Come on, that's like your body's design. So when we awaken the passion, your body's going, let's go, big baby, I'm, I'm ready. So that's why it's hard to stop. That's why people go, we're going to go this far. And we're just, no, 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 listen to me. Don't open that up too early. Don't awaken that too early. Song of Solomon 4.12. You are a garden locked up, my sister. So here's what he changes. He says, he says, you're a garden locked up. What does that mean? That means you waited for me. That means you waited for me. You held, you held this special thing for me. My bride, you are spring, a spring enclosed a sealed fountain, right? Waiting to do this God's way. Number five, godly sex is holy. Godly sex is holy. Now, I'm not dumb, y'all. I am not talking to a room full of virgins. Right? But that was an interesting moment for me. <laughs> virgins, yeah. To me, listen to me. I know I'm not talking to a room full of virgins. I know I'm talking to people. We, we've already admitted and set the ground rules that we all have a messed up in this area. We all have twisted ways that we look. Uh, there's lots of guys here. I'm sorry, but there's lots of guys here that are dealing with porn problems. 
every guy here has a sort of heart problem. What I mean by that is, tell me you don't notice. You notice. Lord have mercy if you go to the beach, man. Bathing suits these days, they pay a lot of money for tooth falls or something. But anyway, we notice, like, we got some strokes. So, so listen to me. When I say holy, some people kind of check out in their mind. Because they go, I'm not holy. This and that and that. Uh, okay, well, let's get on the same level because I didn't wait. I did a lot of things that I shouldn't have done before I married my wife. So what is holy? Because holy is not perfect. I think we messed that up. Do you know what holy is? Catch this, please. It's forgiven. It's forgiven. Because none of us is perfect. We're all sinners. But because Jesus died on the cross for us, his blood cleanses us and free. So I'm not, let's go talk about the past. I'm not here to talk today about your sexual past. I'm here today to talk about your sexual future. I'm here to talk to you about the reality that you can be holy. Right here, right now, today. That you can make the decision, you know what? I'm going to do it God's way, starting today. Today will be the day that I get to look one day and, and say, I waited for you since that moment that I heard this teaching the Holy Spirit put it on my heart and so in that way I made our marriage bed holy are you hearing what I'm saying to you God knows that we're a mess God knows that we got stuff which is why we get the gospel do you know what the, the gospel is let, let me walk through this this is the gospel you ready here, here, here we go put that up for me little Tim God has a standard God has a standard it's, it's way up here and guess what None of us can meet it. <laughs> None of us can meet it because we're sinful. And we're rebellious. And we like things the way we like them. And we want to do it the way we want. And we try to comfort ourselves and feel better. But Jesus died for the violation of it. This is the gospel. And, we, and since he died, now we have the Bible to illuminate us to the standards. What are we doing today? We're just talking about new versions of the standard. We're trying to renew our mind to something different and new, right? I, I, I read my Bible and I just have a hard time doing it. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit empowers us to live it. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So for all of us here today, no matter what happened yesterday, you can make this holy. You can set this right before God by just receiving the reality of the gospel today. That Jesus died and loves you that the Bible, we come here every Sunday and we open up His Word and we try to get a little bit more and then you do your devotions during the week and read His Word and renew your mind to that truth and then ask the Holy Spirit in your prayer time, Holy Spirit empower me today to live, transform change me. You know what the coolest thing about God is? His message is really not behave. That's not His message. We think that's the message. That's called religion. His message is not behave. His message is surrender. If you'll just surrender to doing life the way I've designed it, I will bring the transformation inside of you. I will do the work on your heart. My Holy Spirit will begin to speak into your ear and go, whoa, 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 don't do it. That's not such a good idea. Let's go this way. And then I walk in the Spirit. That's the gospel. That's the message. So in this area of sexuality, we can do this in a way that it's awesome, it's passionate. It's fun. Come on, y'all. We can, we can talk about it unashamedly. Because we haven't twisted it or made it dirty. We've done it in a way that brings joy and fulfillment. And it's holy. Song of Solomon 4.15. You're a garden fountain, a wealth, flowering waters, streaming down from Lebanon. And then he says this word. You ready? Awake. <laughs> Come on, y'all. That's the good stuff. Awake. Like, come on, let's, let's enjoy this. It's a good thing. When it's between two people, the greatest love that can be between any two humans is when a man and woman who are different, who think differently, who see things differently, come on, y'all, you know. Come on, ladies, you speak with a pink megaphone and we hear with blue ear gates. And vice versa. Why would you do it that way, God? 
because I want to teach you that sex is not just about self-fulfillment. It's actually about sacrifice. It's about understanding someone, or at least trying to, or at least just saying, I don't understand, but I'll serve you anyway. It's about understanding and sacrifice. Godly sex is not something out of control. It's not a wildfire burning out of control. When it's put in the proper context of marriage between a man and a woman, but when it's affirming, when it's tender, when it's secure, when it's passionate, when it's holy, there's no anything out there the world can offer that touches it. Nothing. Nothing like it when it's done God's way. He says, awake, north wind, and come, south wind, blow in my garden, that its fragrance may spread everywhere. He's talking about her body. Let my beloved come into the garden and taste its choice fruits. And the reason we read that and kind of go, oh, is that really in the Bible? It's because our minds are a little bit twisted when it comes to this particular area. So can I say this to you? God's way isn't just right. It's better. God's way isn't just right. It's better than anything, any music video or TV show or the notebook. Come on, somebody. Or any silly show might give to you. So can I encourage you with this thought? What messages are you taking in on this particular topic that are twisting what God has just said to us? What music? Come on, ladies. What 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 rom coms? Come on. They get it a little bit out of alignment, a little bit twisted. And can I ask you today? Would you be brave enough to say, Holy Spirit, would you do a work on my mind? To my older folks. You know, I've been married 25 years, and just in the preparation for this, I was like convicted about some things and being a little more tender and the words and having gotten away from the romance and having gotten away from spending time investing in the heart of my wife right in this process. And my hope and desire, <laughs> I don't know, this will weird you out, but whatever, I mean, whatever. I've weirded you out already. I told, I told the worship team earlier, my goal is every married couple goes home and has sex tonight. Come on, man, I'm trying to help you out here. Listen to me, but don't get weird about it. Right? Why does that feel weird? Because it's a good, great thing that God gave us. But how about we do those things? Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? How about we're affirming and we're tender? And young people, listen to me. Wait, it is so worth it to wait. It is so worth it to not bring the garbage of this world into the purity and intimacy that God intends for you. I promise you it's worth waiting. I promise you there's nobody that ever goes, man, I wish I had more sex when I was a kid. Nobody. Nobody. So church, what does it look like for us to switch our thinking and say, okay, God, this is something good that you've created. Let me look at this in a healthy way. Amen? In just a few minutes, I'm going to pray and I'm going to close this. Team's going to worship. But I want to, um, I want to invite you, um, especially if you're married or single, either one, to maybe take a minute, really take a minute today. I know we often say, you know, stay for a minute, worship, and this kind of thing. Hey, hey, husband, maybe take the hand of your wife. And you guys come down to the altar and pray together. Maybe there's an I'm sorry that's due. Maybe there's a I, I'd like to do this a little bit better. And, and, I, and I apologize for getting away from the romance or spending the time or just giving you those things that you need. And I want to be more sacrificial in this. We're going to have some of our prayer team down here. Maybe some of you, when I talk about this, the shame comes. The enemy's just eating you up because of the shame, because... You feel like you've gone too far, and oh well, it's already blown now. You know what one of the biggest lies of the enemy is right now? Well, you've already done it. You might as well keep going. 
That's a lot. Every single one of us here has blown it in different areas of our life. And the creator of the universe says, I love you just like you are. Just come to me and let's start over. My forgiveness, my mercy is new every morning. So what about you? What does it look like for you to submit to godly sexuality? And I want you to respond today in some way. Like I say, couples, maybe it's in there, pray together right there before you leave. Come up, pray with somebody, singles, anybody else, if there's something. Some of you have had some of these things done to you and it was not your choice. And there's a wrestle there. Come and pray with somebody on our prayer team today and let them help you find a little bit of freedom in that. So don't just run out of here today. <laughs> I almost put in the verse and it ended up being sort of a joke in my mind because it's don't just be hearers of the word but doers of the word. <laughs> Had a little bit different meaning today. Can we, can, we, can we make this what it's supposed to be, a joy? Can we, make, can we bring some purity back to this so that we can't talk about it in church without being weird or uncomfortable? Because we recognize that this is something amazing that God has given us. When we do it in his context, we will see blessing and favor. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Let me pray for you. Then we'll close out today. If you're married, let me challenge you. If they're in here, maybe take the hand of your spouse. If you're single, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine taking the hand of Jesus. Say, God, I want to hold on to you to do this in the way that you have for me, waiting for the person that you have for me. But Father, we pray today and we ask, would you do a work in each one of us? Every single one of us is at a different place here, whether single, married. God, we want to do this in a way that brings fulfillment, is kind, is loving, is affirming and tender, and secure and passionate and holy as you created it to be. God, I pray over our, our singles today. For those that are trying to wait, it is hard, hard, hard in this culture today. So Holy Spirit, empower them. For those that have already blown it and feel shame and not talking about it, Holy Spirit, comfort them today that that's why Jesus died on the cross and they are forgiven. They just start over today and walk with you. So God, we submit this to you today. Ask you to do a work in each and every one of our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So don't run off. The team's going to worship. Prayer team's down here and ready. Couples, if you want to come, pray on your own. Singles, let's take a moment and respond to what God said today.